great innovation stories make change possible. Each week on the Innovation Storytellers podcast, I invite innovation leaders to share how they overcame the obstacles to introduce breakthrough ideas to the world through the power of story. I'm featuring guests from Tesla, TD Ameritrade, Corning, Cisco, Bloomberg, and so many more. Listen in to learn how you can tell a more effective innovation story and change the future for the better. Hey, everybody. I'm Susan Linder, your host of Innovation Storytellers, and I'm so excited to be back this week with another new episode. Now, most of the time, I come to you with great innovation minds who are intrapreneurs. These are the folks inside of large corporations who are changing the game. One of my guests, Tendai Vicky, calls these folks the pirates in the Navy. Well, I'm here to introduce you to a former pirate from the Navy who is now taking his mission around water and saving water out into the entrepreneurial world. So please let me introduce you to Steve Waddell, who is the president, CEO, and founder of Masoni. And innovative, he is a, a man with an innovative and entrepreneurial background with over 40 years of experience in business and engineering and leadership and management. From building nuclear-powered aircraft carriers and submarines with NNS to contributing heavily to the growth of Reed Integration, a small business startup into a multi-million dollar government consulting business. Steve developed extensive skills in leading and managing people while managing risk and budget and schedules and stakeholder expectation, which is no small thing. (laughs) But the desire stems from making people's lives better and making the environment better in the process. And so now Steve is working on a whole new way that we're going to see is going to change our lives at home with his brand new invention. And we're going to be talking about it here. So Steve, thank you so much for joining me on Innovation Storytellers today. Thanks, Susan. I'm actually honored to be here. I've listened to some of your former guests and you have an impressive guest list. So I'm honored to be here. Thank you. We're honored to have you. So Steve, the first question I ask all of my guests is no one gets to become an innovator by graduating from college, by figuring out their first job, right? We come to this path often in a very circuitous way. So tell us, how did you get to this point of being a founder of Nasoni, one of the most innovative water faucets in the world? You know, for me, I guess it comes natural. I've always looked for a way to solve problems. I feel Hmm. like I'm a problem solver. As are most engineers, right? This is what you do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I do have an engineering background, but I also have a business background. And, and I started out at Newport News Shipbuilding in, in 1982 as an apprentice. And, and I went through the apprentice school where I worked seven years on the waterfront with my hands. And I learned a lot about how things go together. Then I spent 12 years in engineering, including as a refueling engineer. I had reactor plant 2A for the refueling of the USS Enterprise. A that was one of the most... engineer. So you're the person who figures out how aircraft carriers are refueled at sea? No, it's already figured out. What we had to do oh. was do the actual refueling of the reactor plant. So I led the hourly employees during day shift in their efforts to remove the old fuel. And then uh, we go to put the new fuel back in. Wow. So that was during its midlife. An aircraft carrier generally runs for 25 years on its fuel, and then it needs to be refueled. And the uniqueness about the Enterprise, it has eight reactors. It's the only aircraft carrier with eight. All the other carriers in Nimitz class has two. So it was a, it was the most major nuclear refueling ever undertaken. Wow. And the, the qualifications just to get certified as a shift refueling engineer, you had to go through months and months of training in classroom. And then you take a, it was a nine and a half hour written exam. I wrote 39 oh my pages gosh. in my answers. And then you had to sit in a two hour oral board where you had six people in front of you and a camera. And you know those little desks you sit at in classroom where they have a little uh, table on them? You're at one little desk by yourself. And it's intimidating, right? They want to do that. And you have Bettis Regional Management Office, Naval Reactors, Supervisor of Shipbuilding, RADCON, the Chief Refueling Engineer, all these people sitting there watching you. And then for two hours, they grill you. And they'll say, this such and such situation occurs. What are your actions? What do you do? And, and they actually want you to fail because if you want you to crack, they want you to do it there, not on the job. 
So it was probably the most grueling training I've ever undertaken. Wow. <laughs> and and if you do screw it up there, it's massive, right? The impact is to the planet. It's not just to a person. Absolutely. So I went straight from the waterfront into that. That was my first stint in engineering. Mm. And then after that, if you recall, we had Operation Desert Storm in the early 90s. and the uh, I think the, I might recall that, yeah. <laughs> the country recognized the need to mobilize equipment and troops overseas from the U.S. and realized they didn't have enough capacity. So they needed to convert these sea lift ships. So I worked the sea lift program after that. Um, and I learned a lot of things engineering, but I brought a lot of that um, entrepreneurial spirit that I had from the waterfront and working with my hands that other engineers didn't have because they didn't have that, that time that I spent physically seeing how things go. To, and so I could bring that to the table as well. So I was different than a lot of others. Wow. Uh, yeah. All right. So you're doing this really intensive naval slash nuclear work. What happens then? How do you get to design a bathroom faucet with water fountain feature that none of us knew we needed, but now we can't live without? How did that transition happen? Well, as I mentioned, you know, my, my time in the shipyard was 25 years. And I actually left the shipyard to join my wife's startup, Reed Integration in 2007. And I helped her grow that from nothing into, as you mentioned, a multi-million dollar government consulting business. But along the way, she and I always wanted to go to Italy. I'm just fascinated with Rome. I love Gladiator, the movie Gladiator. It's one of my favorite movies. And I like to make pizza. And she likes wine, different white wines, Pino Grigio, stuff like that. We always want to go to Italy. She for the wine, me for the pizza. And, the, and I want to see the Roman Colosseum. So I'm looking on YouTube one day at different things about Italy, and I run across these two little girls on a cobblestone street. Picture the cobblestone street in Italy, and there's these things called masoni, and they stick up out of the ground like a fire hydrant. And what happens is they take water from the Apennine Mountains that runs through the Roman aqueducts and then up through the streets of Rome through these masoni. And the little girl, there's a tube that hangs off the side, hangs down. Kind of like a big nose. That's where they get the name Nasoni from. It stands for Nasoni means nose. Big nose in Italian. Big nose, <laughs> not even a small nose. Big nose. So, so what they did is they had their dog there, and the dog would drink out of the water coming out of the bottom. But when the dog was done, she took her hand and plugged the bottom, and water came out the top like a water fountain. There was a hole at the apex of that downward tube where it could come out like a water fountain. And then immediately a light bulb goes off in my head. And a spark of inspiration flew. And it's like, you know, why aren't all bathroom faucets like this? I get tired all my life of craning my neck after I brush to rinse and get water. And, and that's initially where it came from. I one time found there's a little attachment that you can buy for kids. It looks like a little whale and it sticks on the bottom of your faucet in the bathroom. It always doesn't ever fit good. It's made of plastic. It gets black mold. And, it, and so I tried that. And it wasn't my answer, but I always knew there'd be a better way. But when I saw that, I immediately knew what the, what the way was. Now it's time to go see if I can make it work. Hmm. And so this simple idea, right, in Da Vinci's home country, suddenly sparked right, this own, your own idea of going, hmm, what could I invent besides a better pasta sauce when I get home? <laughs> I think they got the market right. on that covered in Italy at this point, but <laughs> And I mean, Italy is the home of great design. It's the home of great engineering. It is very ancient artisans who are still using, we are still using their designs today and modernizing those designs. So why did you think, well, first of all, tell us the process of going about it. I'm sure it was no problem. You came home, you drew it, you built it at the end. Overnight success, right? Is that how it went? You know, this is so funny because as a storyteller, there are some amazing stories in this whole thing. And it's going to take a little bit, but I'm going to walk you through some of them, okay? Great. So I decided on New Year's Day one day, that we're, we weren't at work that day because we're off for New Year's, that I would go to Lowe's. I went and I bought um, a faucet. The fiberglass sinks you have in the bathroom, they're a laundry room that are, they're white and they stand up. Yeah, like sure. a tub. So I bought one of those. I bought a faucet and I bought a shutoff valve and I go home and I, I connect it all together to my garden hose in the driveway. Mm -hmm. And I drill a hole in the top of the faucet. I turned the shutoff valve on, turned the water on, and it came out the top just like I thought it would. And I thought, there's my proof of concept. And I that was easy. Water. So that your prototyping was 
uh, a basic sink that you picked up at the Home Depot. How much did that cost you? $89, something like that. It was actually a Lowe's. Lowe's, there you go. <laughs> yeah. And and then I bought a faucet for 59 bucks, just a cheap big box retail faucet. Sure. Because I knew I didn't need it for very long, right? I wouldn't do right. that for the bathroom, but for that, I did. And, but and lessons in prototyping are really important for everybody on this call. Everybody who's watching, listening to this podcast is we do these prototyping uh, scenarios all day. And you got to find it at the hardware store. See, I wouldn't even call it prototyping yet. I would call it proof of concept. Could mm-hmm. I make it even do what I wanted it to do? And so that's that's what I call it. But yeah, once I did that, I was excited, right? And so I make a little video of this with the water coming out of the top. And I take it to my 80-year-old stepfather because he had been in the plumbing industry working in the aircraft carrier program, doing all the piping systems as the superintendent. Mm-hmm. And so he... You know, all my life, we did home ed- room additions, remodeling since I was 12 years old working for him. He was a big inspiration to me, both literally and figuratively, because he's six foot three and I'm five eight on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I, I take it to him. I'm all excited about how this proof of concept was working and I wanted to show it to him. And he looks at it and he laughs and he goes, What are you going to do with that? And I said, Well, when you get done brushing your teeth, you need a way to rinse, right? You got to tilt your head, cup your hand, or use a cup. And he goes, no. I said, no. I said, what do you do? He goes, oh, hell, I just take my teeth out and put them in a cup. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of that one. <laughs> That's an easier way. We could all consider doing that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that that he he then said he bet me $1,000. I'd never sell one. Wow. Right. Wow. I so, love it when people tell me no. I don't know how you feel about it, but it <laughs> energizes me. It's exactly right. That's what it did for me. Now I'm really out to go make it happen. Right. right. So then it becomes, okay, how do I, I need to come up with an engineer design, right? And of course, I knew people at the shipyard that could do this, but they didn't have the tools at home. They didn't have the software tools. So I reached out to a local university, Old Dominion University, and, mm-hmm. and the engineering guy that I knew there that ran engineering. And I said, hey, Gates, could you help us out? Modeling and simulation, in fact, is what he did. And, and he got back to me, said, this is better suited to mechanical, put me over to them. And then I never heard from them. And I thought, okay, that's not my answer either. I thought it'd be a student project. So then I turned to something I had heard about called Elance. Elance, I, yes. I found a freelancer in Thailand that had CAD modeling, fluid dynamics, and all the things I needed. But he's from the U.S., but he's living in Thailand. And I hired him. And we actually developed some really cool new designs that we could make work. And he showed me the fluid computations and things of that nature. And so now not knowing how this process should work, my next thought is, oh, I got to protect it, right? That's what everybody thinks that your next step is, I've got this cool idea. I now have a design. I got to protect it. So then I go to hire an attorney and I couldn't find one locally because I didn't want thousands of dollars. Right. And I feel like, okay, what, what can I do about this? So I went back to Elance. And I found an attorney in India that was about one fifth of the cost of what would be locally. And I hired that attorney because he worked with the U.S. Patent Office. So we applied for both a utility patent and a design patent. Now, I didn't I was learning the difference between design and utility because I'd never done any patents before, but it just felt right at the time. And so the cool thing was we applied for those. And within one year, the design patent was approved. Now, did it matter? No. The design patent's worthless, right? Because make one slight change and your design patent is no longer relevant. Mm. But where it was valuable was now I needed funds to help me develop a prototype as we talked about, right? So I start entering startup competitions. And the first one I entered was put on by Cox Media and Inc. Magazine in Virginia Beach. And the prize was 10000 in cash and prizes for the judge's favorite and $250 American Express gift card for the audience favorite. So they had two different prizes. They, they down-selected all the entrants down to the top five. I was picked as one of the top five. I had no prototype, right? <laughs> so I go to the event. We get a table that we could set up to tell people about what we're doing before they went in. And I take my computer and I put my engineering CAD model on my iMac, 27 inch iMac. And I have it rotating and moving and doing. And I got my, I had just gotten my design patent the week before. So it's laying on the table. <laughs> and I had run some, some numbers on how much money it would save and so on. So we get in and I give my two minute pitch. You have two minutes, you can pitch the judges. 
And, and then they asked me some questions. Long story short, won the judge's favor. So I won 10,000 in cash and prizes. And not only that, I won the audience favorite too. So I swept wow. the competition. <laughs> And Fantastic. that gave me the money I needed to go build the first prototype. I used $7,500 to go build the first prototype. And then also, uh, my wife said, now, look, you need to have that money go into a business account so that it doesn't hit our personal tax. She's the one started her company, and she knows those rules and stuff. Because yeah, I was a newborn ship building. I didn't know small business like she did. So that's what we did. That's when we founded the company was July 2015, July 1st. And I put that money into that account. And, and then I built the first prototype. I had a company build it for me that does prototyping. And it was like, I, I read about this company from the Mom Inventors Handbook. Like Tamara Monosov, I think is her name. Hmm. And she had mentioned, I was reading every invention book I could find, trying to learn everything I could, right? Because I'm all new to this. I'd been in big business, Fortune 500 for 25 years. And then my wife's company as a startup for seven years, but nothing on how to bring a product to market. So I'm, I'm still feeling my way and I'm still entering competitions. I went another one for $750 at Old Dominion University and it's called 757 Pitch, which also gave me $20,000 in consulting help from the wow. organization. All in all, I won over $80,000 in, in cash and prizes. How fantastic. <laughs> so took, you tried everything out with your own little mini shark tank to get started, right? I did, but I took that prototype that I had made for $7,500 and I videoed that. And there was a new TV show coming out called Steve Harvey's Thunderdome. Did you ever hear that? No. Yeah, it was Steve Harvey's Thunderdome, 2017 time frame, And I was actually, I took the video, I applied with it, went back and forth a number of times with what they asked for. And I was actually picked to fly to Hollywood, CBS television studios. And I competed on stage against another entrepreneur who invented a mask to relieve sinus pressure that was a heated mask. And he was at one podium. I was at the other, Steve Harvey in the middle. He visited each of us and we had to get the audience vote. Long story short, I won 50,000 in that. And you don't get paid right after the show. They didn't pay until a year later. So mm -hmm. I go to the bank and I say, hey, I, I won this competition. I'm going to get the money. I can prove it. Can you give me a loan? And they, they said, well, there's a lot of paperwork to go through, and yada, yada, yada. And as I talked to this VP that I knew, I said, well, what about a credit card? He goes, oh, yeah, we can do that really easy. He gave me a $50,000 credit card. I charged everything that whole year in developing the product and then paid it off when that credit card, when that $50,000 came in in cash. Okay. So these are all the good sides of the equation, right? We're winning competitions. We're getting some publicity. We're getting seen. Hell, we even got funding from a bank. But Things aren't all rosy in the land of entrepreneurship. What were some of the challenges that you faced along the way? Some of the, the mess ups, the God, I wish I knew now moments that you had in as you got to the creation of, of the faucet. That, that's a great question because the very next thing is I think I'm winning these competitions. I'm going to go hit all of them, right? So I, sure. applied, for one. I applied for another one called Entrepreneur Elevator Pitch. Oh. But this one, you had to pay your own way to California, pay your own hotel, and, and I did. And you get 60 seconds on an elevator with a camera on just you. And the judges are all at the top. And if they like your pitch on the elevator, they open the door and let you finish it. If they don't like it, they send you back down. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, all right, well, how do I, how do I make sure I win? Right? So this is a reality show. And I thought, let me make it intriguing. Now I, I had actually developed with that $50,000 our real first product. So I have something really cool and I'm excited about it. And we took it to the kitchen and bath industry show and we won the audience, the people's favorite. We didn't win the judge's favorite because that actually went to the big name company that sponsors the show. <laughs> they won. But, Surprise. But we, were right. <laughs> but we won the people's favorite, right? People's choice. Yes. Award. And so I go to this elevator pitch and I, I take this in a bag. And I also have it on stands, like the one there. And I go to Walmart, I buy three shelves on, a, on wheels, and I put each of those on stands, and I cover the whole thing up with a black tablecloth. And I, I'm standing on the elevator like that, not showing the product. And I tell the judges, we reinvented the faucet. It's amazing. We just won the Best of KBiz People's Choice Award. We're patented. We're, we're at the goal line. We're ready to cross it. And with your help, we're going to get there and reinvent the whole bathroom market, right? 
And next thing you know, I'm going back down. What like, happened? Why didn't they open the door, right? <laughs> so you don't know why. And you get sent home. Well, two weeks later, it aired on TV, not TV, on YouTube. It aired on YouTube. And so I see what happens is after I pitch, there were two women judges and two male judges. And one of the ladies says, oh, this world always leaves you wanting more. I want to know what it looks like. I want to know what it is. And then the other guy goes, yeah, that's true. He says, but uh, he didn't tell us what he wanted and uh, didn't show us the product. So I say, vote him, let him go. And the other one goes, yeah, I agree. Let him go. Well, I was going to tell him what I wanted and all that after they opened the doors. That was the rest of the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's your downside, right? And you, I, I thought to myself, God, why did this happen? Why did this door close on me so hard that I'd mm-hmm. spent this money that I didn't have a lot of, and I could have used it elsewhere if I'd have known this was going to happen? And you just don't know. You don't know what's ahead. Well, right. check this out. There's a lady from the Richmond District SBA that I'd worked with, with my wife's company in the past. She happened to see that on YouTube. Like, How the heck do you even know about it? Well, she saw it. She calls a friend of hers she rode the school bus with 50 years ago. And, and like either her mother or his mother was a school bus driver. I don't know which it was. And she tells him, you got to meet Steve. So this guy calls me the next week. His name's Ben. And he said, I have an investor company that I work with. And tell me about your faucet. And I tell him all about it. He goes, would you like to meet them? They're in Minnesota. I said, yeah, sure. So the next week we have a call with them and we'll call with Dave and, and, um, and Ron and Sue. And the call went great. And they said, look, if we're going to go any further, we think you need to come to Minnesota and meet with us. I said, all right. <laughs> so I've never been to the Mall of America. I'm a kind of guy. I'm not the normal guy. I like the mall. And it's the biggest mall we got, right? So I booked the JW Marriott because I want to market them on the faucet while I'm there. <laughs> nice. This, and, this is the thinking of an entrepreneur, right? Yeah. Is there a faucet in the Marriott? Maybe I could convince them they need a different faucet. <laughs> there is, and it didn't work well either. It, it there you go. Turn it on. You're exactly right. So my <laughs> wife and I fly there, and we had a fantastic meeting with the, the investor company, and they ended up investing $600,000 in the company, and that was our first launch. That allowed us to go into production and, and get certified, and all these other things, and it led to another round of investment by a guy that's actually in the faucet business. He's, he, he's local here to my area. And he runs Virginia Maryland Associates, which they sell plumbing supplies, hot water heaters, and things like that. And he, he looked at it, and his name's Craig Johnson, and he said, I've been in this business for 26 years, and there hadn't been any change in all these years, really, of meaning. And he goes, I'd like to be involved. So we let him invest as well. And he's now, they're both on my board. We have a board of directors and a board of managers, really. But so your negative actually was it turned into a positive. If I hadn't have gone... You know. And failed, they never would have seen the video. So you That's never right. know what God has planned, right? That's right. So a friend of mine said to me, when one door closes, another one opens, but it's the hallway that's hell. And <laughs> yeah. and I agree with that because while you're waiting for that funding, while you're one waiting for the other shoe to drop, while you're waiting for that window or that door to open again, it can feel excruciating. But that is the process from going from a caterpillar to cocoon to butterfly, right? That reorganization, even of one's mindset, is what's so critical to get to that next stage too and to be open to that next stage. So speaking of which, that next that next phase is where you are now. So you've developed, and for my listeners, if you have the opportunity to go to the YouTube channel and watch this interview, you can see this beautiful faucet and the at the arc of water coming out of that top curvature of the faucet that turns your faucet into a water fountain. And so tell us a little bit just about what the benefits of the faucet are. Like why, why would anyone install a water fountain with faucet? Why does this matter to us? You know, what was the impetus question. and what have you found people using it for since? Sure. That's a great question because when I initially developed this, they say the mother of invention, right, is solving a problem, right? Solving your own problem. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what I was doing. My problem was I got tired of craning my neck and there had to be a better way. And I said, if the faucet manufacturers aren't going to do it, I could, if I can build an aircraft carrier work doing that, I know I can fix a faucet. <laughs> Wait, can so we just start with the problem for a second? So the first problem is I don't want to crane my neck, right? Exactly. That's step one. 
But the other option is a cup, right? We're getting down to very simple innovation problems. And why is the cup a bad idea? Because the, for a number of reasons. One, cups actually harbor germs. So we have a thing called the aerosol effect. When you flush a toilet, bioaerosols are ejected, float in the air, and they land on the surface of the bathroom, including that cup that never gets washed often enough. Right, and, and then you know, everyone's always, using in the family, right? Everyone's using the same cup. Yeah. yeah, and I'd always hypothesized it was cleaner to drink from the fountain feature, but I never had any proof. So Dr. Anna Jang at Old Dominion University at the School of Environmental Health, she actually did a study for us with her students, and they have scientific proof that it's cleaner to drink from the fountain feature than it is a glass. They exposed it to E. coli. It's true germs, right? And their results were published in the Virginia Journal of Public Health in the spring 2020 edition. So it was published in a scientific journal. So we actually have scientific proof it's cleaner to drink from. And the other thing, if you think about it, let's say you lost your eyesight, right? You don't know if that cup is clean or dirty sitting there. Mm -hmm. Let's say if it's a glass and you drop and it breaks, what do you do then? You might step on it. But if you have a water fountain built into your faucet, you're going to have that natural memory to know exactly how high it is and where to go to get your, your drink of water. Okay. So I'll give you some pushback, right? I mean, how large is the target market for those who have difficulty seeing? So break down for us, like what are the different personas that you're selling to? Who are, because it's really important for us as innovation storytellers to know our market, to know mm -hmm. who we're speaking to so we can craft the messages for those particular groups. So who benefits from this faucet and how did you figure out these different buyer personas? We're still figuring those out, but let me share with you some of the things we've learned. We have one of my investors in Minnesota. He actually has a friend in Canada that used to own the largest chain of retirement homes. And he showed the faucet to him and the guy says, you know what? This would really help our aging population because two things. One, dehydration is a big problem with seniors in retirement homes. And so access to water in those retirement homes is not very easy. You may think it is, but it's actually not. And when you're dehydrated. Because you have to call somebody to get it, right? You have to call a nurse to get a glass uh, of water. Well, you may have a sink in your bathroom or your mm. kitchen, but you've got to have that cup, right? You've got to have a glass. It's just not convenient, uh -huh. right? And so um, the other thing is when you're dehydrated, your mouth becomes acidic. So that becomes an oral hygiene issue with acidic because it eats away at your teeth. In a lot of cases, they'll take a candy or something like that, and, and then that exacerbates the problem because now you're adding sugar in your mouth and things of that nature. So he saw it as a means to help aging in place seniors. Not aging in place, that would be at home, but those in retirement homes, okay? It would also help aging in place at home as well. The other thing is kids. Kids don't like to brush their teeth because it's not fun, right? We actually have a dad who bought these faucets and installed them and said, these are great. He said, my only problem now is the kids fight to see who gets to brush their teeth first because they love the water fountain. How fun. <laughs> and it becomes actually an educational moment. We're going to be at the Kitchen and Bath Industry Show February 8th to the 10th in Orlando at booth number 447 in the Wellness Pavilion. And we bought these two-minute sand, dental sand timers, they're called. And the reason we have those is the American Dental Association recommends you brush for two minutes, right? There are four quadrants in your mouth. They recommend 30 seconds in each quadrant. And so what happens is one third of Americans leave the water running when they brush. And if you do that and you compare how much water is wasted, leaving your water running on the downward flow versus our water fountain, you save almost uh, four gallons. You'll use with a 2.2 GPM faucet, you'll use 4.4 gallons with the water running down. With our fountain feature, you'll only use half a gallon. So it's a massive water savings. So there's two things here. One, you can teach kids how long to brush, right? The two minutes. You can show them also about water conservation and why it's important. And you can tell them because I don't know, many people don't realize this, right? But how much of the world of the of the water in the on the earth is accessible to us right now? I'm asking you. I don't know. I mean, the oceans, the lakes, the rivers, they're not really accessible to us with the exception of those that are dammed and filtered, right? So Let's just say how, much is, how much is fresh water? On the how earth? much is fresh water? 20%? So 97% of the earth is covered by salt water. There's only 3% that's fresh. Of wow. the 3%, two of it is trapped in glaciers as ice. So we only have access to 1%. Now, by 2030, 
Demand will exceed supply by 40% globally. We have a massive water crisis on our hands. So Nasoni, with our fountain feature, you're, everything you do with this, you save water every time you use the fountain feature versus the downward spout. And you're making your life easier. So to get back to your point about use cases and personas, my wife, every night before bed, used to take and cup her hands and splash her face to get her facial cleanser off. Now she turns on a fountain, a warm, gentle fountain stream and dips her face into it. Now she ain't even thinking about really saving water, but she's doing that every time. And she's not making a mess because she's not splashing the counter and it's just more functional. And I got another guy who told me that every spring and fall, he gets seasonal allergies and he has to flush his eyes. Well, we have a great water filter that we recommend. It's We developed it for under the counter in the bathroom. Now you can have clean filtered water to clean your eyes with, just with a perfect fountain stream. And the unique thing about this that I never thought about originally, if you think of a water fountain, water fountains go left to right or right to left, right? You ever drank from one that came toward you? You haven't. Right. You're still craning your neck at most water fountains. <laughs> Ours comes right to you. It's just a better user experience. And so it gives you all that functionality. If we re- went left to right in some kind of way, it hits you in the side of the head. Instead, it hits you perfectly for rinsing your eyes, getting a drink, rinsing your face, rinsing shading. And, and there's even a case where my father was in a retirement home and he had been in the army, been in the military. He had his knees replaced at one point, both knees. And there were days he didn't want to stand in the shower. He couldn't get his head underneath the spout of the bathroom faucet. So I had the maintenance guy there install a fountain faucet for him. Now he could give his hair a light rinse. That's all he wanted to do those days. Just give his hair a light rinse. Hmm. So he couldn't do it without it. Right. So we're finding new ways all the time on how the fountain faucet make, I call it make life easier. (laughs) <laughs> and is that a result of really doing this kind of user testing, user experience testing? So many of our listeners are in the product management, user experience, customer experience space that you're collecting this as you're developing the product and as you go on to continue to engineer the product, right? Because you had you had version one and you're now on to version two of the product. Is that right? So, well, so let me give you an additional backstory. Jeff Johnson's a good, great friend of mine. He runs tech center in Newport News. That's a $450 million development between Virginia Tech and WM Jordan. He runs the whole place. Hmm. He's been an advisor to me since I first got in those competitions in 2015. He would tell me things like, we recommend, I recommend three $20,000 focus groups. I didn't have 60 grand to go run focus groups. You're like, I recommend them too. If you wouldn't mind funding them, that would be great. (laughs) <laughs> right. So that was my challenge. Focus groups are great, but can you afford them? How can you do it? You can't. Well, not when you're a startup bootstrapping like myself. Right. So, no, we didn't come about it the way you would in a big company. Like a lot of your other people you interview, they have an R&D department. They have an R&D budget. They can go do these things. So mine was more to try to interview people, try to get it in use in some places, test it out, get the feedback where you can. And so we've been learning. Now, our, our, one of our biggest challenges was we launched right at the start of COVID. Who knew that was coming? I developed the risk management process for the aircraft carrier program at Newport News Shipbuilding. And Defense System Management College recognized that as the best industry practice. So Donald Rumsfeld, I don't know if you remember him. Sure. Right? He, had, he said there are three things about risk. There are known knowns, there are known unknowns, and there are unknown unknowns. You remember that? We, no, we all follow no, that in innovation. We, we try to answer those questions on a regular basis. Absolutely. Exactly. So I would say COVID is a unknown unknown. And maybe you could maybe make a case for known unknown. It could happen, but you don't know what the outcome would be. Mm. But I would say we had no idea in launching our product that we would be involved in a hundred year pandemic when we launched. You couldn't plan for that. Nope. So we had this inventory we selected four key states. We know California has a water problem. So we selected a manufacturer up in California. We selected one in Texas because areas of Texas have a water problem. We have one in Florida because water, even they got a lot of water, but there's a lot of salt water. I mean, Tampa Bay spent $10 million in desalinization plants. And then we selected Virginia and we shipped them pallets of faucets. And then COVID hit and they couldn't meet with anybody to sell them. They couldn't market to anybody. But Steve, help explain to our audience 
why this device, which seems to offer two outputs of water is actually water saving. Because if you're just listening to the podcast, you probably can't see how a faucet with a water fountain coming out of it would actually save you water. Beautiful question. So there are basically three types of faucets in America, in the U.S. The natural normal bathroom faucets have what's called 2.2 gallons per minute. So you think about the water coming down when you turn it on, that's at a rate of 2.2 GPM. And think about that now, that's 2.2 gallons. That's like two gallons of milk dumping at the same time. That's a lot, a lot of flow. So the Environmental Protection Agency came out with what they call water sense more than 10 years ago, and they reduced that flow rate to 1.5 GPM. Make sense? So you're yeah. still, though, that's one and a half you know, gallons of milk being dumped at the same time per minute. And then so California, because they're under this higher drought than anywhere else in the country, they enacted what's called CEC, California Energy Commission Compliant. And they reduce the rate to 1.2. Now, in some commercial hotels, you'll see the water's really poorly flowing. That's a 0.35 GPM. And people have a bad experience. People have complain because they can't get all the soap off their hands, things like that. So that's why the whole industry has not gone that route for everybody. Mm. All right. Now, conversely, when I take that, and I'll show it on here, when I shut off that downward flow, and we turn this little lever and send it out the top. There's nothing coming out of the bottom anymore. We worked with a company called Neopearl. They are the largest manufacturer of strainers in the world. And we work directly with them. Strainers my, my are thinking, the faucet specifically. Yes. And, and my thinking was, you know, I'm, I'm used to building aircraft carriers, right? So I wanted to build a faucet built to last. All right. And so I want to work with the best. So anyway. We came up with a flow regulator that's commercial off the shelf, COTS as we call it, that has a flow rate of only 0.26 gallons per minute. And what that does is it causes the water to create the perfect water fountain and land it in the center of your sink without overshooting it. Mm -hmm. It's a consistent, no matter what the water pressure coming in is, it keeps a consistent about five inch height water fountain. But that flow rate is cut from either 2.2, 1.5 or 1.2 down to only 0.26. So you're saving as much as 88% water every minute you use this faucet, the fountain feature. And we actually, because it's so massive, we built a water saving calculator on our website. And if you go to our website, you'll find our water saving calculator. You can plug in your numbers for your city, how much your water costs. Now there are typically three things, water rates you'll be billed for. The water rate, the sewage rate, right? And then there's one other. So you get billed on all three of those. At least we are here in Suffolk, Virginia. You can enter your own rates for your own city and it'll show you how much, how much you could save annually in terms of the sewer rate, the water rate, all of that, but also greenhouse gas. Because when we don't have to manufacture and produce all this water, the water we save and by not producing it, we benefit in not having as much greenhouse gas created. It's funny because I don't think anybody thinks about how as humans, we manufacture water, right. but that is the process, right? It takes energy to harvest water, filter water, clean that water, and then deliver water. It's not See, that's like the it point, magically though, is clean. appears. That's the, one of the key words is clean. Mm. And then there's still a problem with that. I'll, I'll give you an example. And you remember Flint, Michigan, and they found lead in the water? Sure. There's another city in, in Michigan now that has found lead in their water. They're not the only ones. Right. So Newark, New aging. Jersey is experiencing the same thing and they're doing a whole remediation now. It's it's agony. Right. And we have an aging infrastructure in the U.S. with a lot of our waterway, water lines. And think how many times that water line is cut into when they dig new roads and new sewer systems and, and add on to these cities. So every time you do that, and you disrupt that line that leads water to your house, you're introducing impurities into the water you drink. And guess what? You're not going to know that because when they test the water, they test it at the reservoir, not as it comes to your house. So we think the best line of defense is to put this under counter water filter right in your bathroom, underneath in the vanity. This is NSF certified to get rid of lead and other nasties, that sort of thing but leave behind the good minerals that you can use in your water that are good for you. 
Right. Because we still want the water to be alive. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. So tell us one more time. I mean, the challenges of not getting a competition are one thing, Steve, but the challenge is scaling, right? Getting to the next stage of development of getting into big box stores or getting even into luxury stores, if that's the case. What's the plan for the product now that you've found your personas? Sounds like you're really still finding your market, but you've developed some, some good prospects of where to start. What's the next step for scaling? Because for many people, this is that make or break, right? This is the hallway moment. Great question. So when we initially did this, uh, you know, I decided we would come out with a product that I felt was built to last. And so when you look at building a faucet, there are three key things that, that they're made out of. First one is the best faucets are made of solid brass. So we make our faucets out of solid. It weighs six and a half pounds. And the third, second thing is you don't want it to leak. If the faucet leaks, it's not a good faucet. The best valves for faucets are ceramic disc. And that's all we use. We use them both in the handles and the up top. And then the third thing is it's got to look good. So the best finish you can get is called physical vapor deposition or PVD. It's just a space age process. And that's what we use for this as well. So we use all of that, which also then puts your faucet into a price point that's not big box retail. This is more what you would find at a Ferguson, a place like Ferguson. And the starting point for solid brass faucets is around 325. And then you add for new features like the fountain capability and stuff like that. When, you, when we started to look into this, once we went to production, we made these. And as we look at our channel strategy, the channel strategy we're in right now is not big box retail because this is not a price point to sit on the shelf at big box. So we said, okay, what's next for that? And the idea there was we have what we call our new single post faucet that we've, we've designed. And it only has one lever, like a kitchen faucet. That's what we mean by that. That faucet we can make a lot cheaper. There's less materials to make it. It also is cheaper, let's say, if you go into a hotel, think about building a hotel with 300 rooms. Mm -hmm. you got to drill 300 holes for this faucet that we currently have, whereas you'd only do one for a single post. So I... especially if you're doing granite or marble, that's a lot of drilling. So what, we, what we're calling this now, we've labeled this our North Star product. <laughs> I've coined that term. because. That's going to get us, we think, into the big box arena. And, and one of the neat things is we've been introduced to a guy that's a former executive vice president of marketing at Lowe's, and he's been bringing us some new connections and introductions are going to help us quite a bit. As we so if you can envision the story that you're going to tell Lowe's, because we're all about the storytelling here at Innovation Storytellers. So what's the story that you plan to tell the guy at Lowe's about why he needs to bring your product on board? One of the things Lowe's is introducing is an aging in place section, right? So they want to help people with, that are wanting to age in place at home. So <laughs> as you can see in our faucet, benefits to seniors. <laughs> uh, so you've created a marketing one sheet for those of, uh, those of our audience who are listening. You've created a marketing one sheet that specifically calls out those benefits, but let me just walk you through, if you don't mind, the five steps to innovation storytelling that we talk about on this show. Number one is a shared history. The way you get your prospect on the same footing as you is to talk about a mutual experience that you've both had. Mm -hmm. The fact that you bought that sink at Lowe's when you were <laughs> still in testing mode is that step one, the history that you both share that maybe he, he clearly probably doesn't know. So that's step one. Step two is the core values that you both share. So what are the, where do we drive people to from its essence, the essence of your business and the essence of Lowe's business, where you share values, not even value proposition yet, values. Mm -hmm. So I'd ask you to think about and consider what are those values and then a shared purpose. So now that shared purpose is aging in home as a starting point, right? But it's also maybe even multi-generational families of caregivers and an elderly, that could be another point. Step well, in three. The, in, the broader, Go ahead. in the broader context of my background, as I looked at my life, I'm nearing, at some point I'll be nearing retirement age. You know, I'm not in no rush to get there. But as I look back, I said, 25 years in the shipyard, I did a lot of great things, did a lot of great things for my wife's company. I wanted to develop a product that would make people's lives better while saving water to benefit the planet 
and be a good role model to our two sons and other entrepreneurs along the way. If I could do that, I would feel like I then made a real difference in life. Mm. And so that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Talk about the shared purpose. That's my purpose right now. Yeah. So when we make our listener the hero, how you can empower that listener, all the better. So how you'll make Lowe's the hero rather than you or your family or anything that's coming next is really critical. So that next phase is what's the message that you'll share. Mm -hmm. And figuring out that message is really important as well as the next phase, which are what's the viral language that you'll use? What is a phrase or something that you can say about Nasoni that will stick with him so that as soon as he leaves the meeting, he'll be able to share it with other people. Because if it goes off into the air, then the idea is also potentially vanishing. Agreed. And, and so we're still working through that. But one of the ones that I have now that I like to use is save water without trying. You're mm. saving, you're doing it to for its convenience to make your life better, but you're saving water and you're not even trying to do that. So you're doing something good. <laughs> save water effortlessly. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, without even trying. And then finally, who are the early adopters? Who are the people, right? And I've seen the beautiful videos on your site of people talking about a million ways of, you know, thinking about using the product that they haven't thought of before. But who are the early adopters who will stand on the mountaintops and sing your name? Who are the missionaries in the world who will take the message forward? Yeah, we, we have those right now. In fact, everybody that has been using the faucet is a believer now. And then, so, the, but one of the guys told me, it wasn't something I knew that I needed, but now that I have it, I don't want to live without it. This is exactly, this is a conversation I bring it up way too often on the show, but my mom is 94. And when I ask her, what is the greatest innovation she's seen over her lifetime? She just tells me dishwasher pods. <laughs> and I was like, not the dishwasher, right? And she goes, no, it always leaves stuff caked on until I got the dishwasher pods. Then life changed and life got better. And so it's those little things that made it better because I was the chief dishwasher when I was a kid. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, we were actually developing our R&D pipeline. We're still coming up with new products. And I'm working on a grant with the National Institute of Health right now. And that's to put sensors on our phone so we can help those with spinal cord injury and things of that nature. But mm. I actually shared this with the former COO of Lowe's and he's retired. And, and he told me, he said, I could actually see my 93-year-old mother who deals with arthritis daily, benefiting from that. Yeah. You speak about your 94-year-old, it, it, it dawned on me to think about his, because same age almost. Right. Okay. So now is the time on, on the podcast where I ask you three hot seat questions. Are you ready? Sure. Okay. If you could join any innovation team anywhere in the history of time, right, throughout history, Whose innovation team would you like to join? I, there's people you can think about the past with Steve Jobs and everything, but right now it'd have to be Elon Musk. I am so impressed going to Mars and all the other things he's doing. It would just have to be Elon. <laughs> and if you're it listening, Elon, Elon. I, I want to be with you. If you're out there listening, Elon, we've got new <laughs> members for your team and they work cheap just for the record. <laughs> okay. So, um, Greatest innovation of all time. What do you think? And you can maybe have one or two. I don't want to limit you, but what do you think sure. some of the greatest innovations of all time? Well, obviously I'm a big iPhone fan. It'd be easy to say that, but I talked about my wife one time about this. And I said, our, our parents and grandparents all saw things come along in their lifetime, like planes and automobiles and, and then the radio and TV. I said, I think our biggest innovation so far in our lifetime would probably be the internet and how it's made the world such a smaller place. Because it, as an example, in bringing the Sony to life, I have worked with hundreds of freelancers from more than 35 countries. Wow. And, and in these different startup competitions, some of them are voting online. I've gotten votes from all over the world. My Every time I do this, I develop a relationship. I mean, I've got, got people in Pakistan that I'm friends with, that I've made good friendships with. And you yeah. think about it at a global level, how you know we're not necessarily on good terms with each other at the senator and above level, right? But at the, at the diplomatic at, level, right? Yeah, at our level, I'm loving these people. They're great. Yeah. <laughs> Entrepreneurs are a whole different nation altogether, right? We're yeah, a whole different exactly. tribe of people. So that's fantastic. And we had the head of open innovation for NASA on the show. 
and he talked about crowdsourcing the NASA logo for its 50th anniversary. So they have a great team of graphic designers inside of NASA, but what they wanted to do is harness the love of space and space travel among the worldwide community. And it wound up being a couple in Australia who designed the logo for the 50th anniversary of one, one would see as the really American institution, but the rest of the world feels like they own a piece of NASA too. And well, so, if, yeah. if you think about everything about aliens and you think the whole world would come together as one against if there was an invading force. You sure about that? I'm not too <laughs> sure about anything right now, but I know so. Okay. Last question. If there's anything that bothers the heck out of you that you could fix, that you could invent, if you wish, oh, I just wish this innovation would take place. What would it be? It's not really an innovation, but it's something that bothers. We cannot, as entrepreneurs, really have enough voice with our senators and congressmen. Mm. There have been issues that have gone through that I've dealt with, and I raise the issue to, to them. I'll reach out to them, and it really falls on deaf ears. You'll get a letter back. It'll just blow you off. But we need a stronger voice. And I don't know if Josh Malone, Josh invented a bunch of balloons and he has fought the battle with the U.S. Patent Office for many years because big tech. I think one of the senators just recently said, if you were to take the patent examiner's office and flip their upside down, big tech would fall out of their pockets. Right. Because they're canceling out patents by all these young startups and other entrepreneurs because they're they're letting big companies like Apple and others who have a big legal team. You know, win the battle. And a big, bigger lobbying team. So we need a better voice. If, if there was a way to invent a better voice to help us with that, that's what I would like to see fixed. Hmm. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Tell us once again where you're going to be, what booth, and when, in case people want to check out the coolest faucet you can imagine. So the biggest show in the country, the entire country for kitchen and bath products is the Kitchen and Bath Industry Show put on by the NKE, BA. National Kitchen and Bath Association. It's coming up February 8th to the 10th in Orlando, Florida. If you want a free exhibit hall pass, now we're talking about a million square foot location facility. Bring two pairs of sneakers. Go ahead. And the, and the <laughs> International Business Show is happening at the same time. And, and so anyway, you can go to my website, nasoni.com, and there's actually a KBiz link in the top navigation Click on KBIS, K-B-I-S, in our top nav, and it'll take you to a page. On that page, you can get a link to register for free exhibit hall pass on behalf of Nasoni. And we'll be there, booth number 447 in the West Hall in the Wellness Pavilion. And we're Fantastic. super excited. We actually were down selected as part of the Best of KBIS competition for our single post faucet. There were hundreds of entrants. They down selected at 35. Our name is in there along with all the big companies. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we wish you all the best of luck in winning that competition. We hope that is the other door that opens and a lot of other, a lot more cash flows through it. Thank you so much, Steve, for joining me today. Susan, thank you for what you do. You know, for me, I, I love podcasts and I love audiobooks. I've gotten rid of the hard books now. Me and too. Fascinating for me to, when I'm driving or mowing the grass or whatever, to have a great podcast like yours to listen to. So thank you. Oh. Thank you so much. In service of great innovators everywhere. (laughs) Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Steve. You do the same. Thank you. Now you might be asking, Susan, why innovation storytelling? Well, the truth is that an innovation story told well not only breaks down communication barriers so you can drive change and new growth, but it also helps other people remember and champion your work and it propels your best ideas forward faster to secure you the runway, resources, and recognition you so richly deserve. In other words, stories are memory-making devices that significantly reduce the time it takes for you and your innovation to be understood. But like many leaders, you probably never got the memo that storytelling skills would be central to your success. Well, I've got some good news for you. It's not too late because I've got you covered. Whether you need an expert to come and speak to your innovation leaders, you need training in the art and method of innovation storytelling, or you just need the support and guidance of a consultant who can get you where you want to go in less time, visit www.susanlinder.com today to learn more and to set up a call to discuss your needs. 
I'm so looking forward to connecting with you and to helping you tell a great innovation story. If you like what you heard so far, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another episode and leave us a comment. Tell us what you think of this episode. We'd love to hear from you. And if you didn't like what you've heard, just forget everything I've said.